You may know Wendy Crewson from her current role as Dr. Dana Kinney in Saving Hope, or playing Sue Rodriguez, the ALS sufferer who wanted the right to die, or President Harrison Ford's wife in Air Force One. But the fact is, she's got a hundred other titles to her name over three and a half decades in the entertainment business. She's got a star on Canada's Walk of Fame and is the 2016 recipient of the Earl Grey Award for acting at the Canadian Screen Awards happening on Sunday. And Wendy Crewson joins us now. I can't believe I haven't met you before today. This is really appalling that we haven't met until now. I, it's crazy. But it's a great thrill to meet you now. It's an honor. Because of course I'm I've thrilled. watched all of your stuff over the years. Let's just, uh, Sheldon, shall we bring this chart up? We'll bring this up. Wendy's born in 1956 in Hamilton, Ontario. Can you believe this woman's about to turn 60? My God. <laughs> Graduated from Queen's University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in drama. That was in 1977. Her first role was a CBC film called War Brides in 1980. Seven Gemini Awards, or Canadian Screen Awards as they're now called, including the 2002 Humanitarian Award, and as mentioned, just received a star on Canada's Walk of Fame. Congratulations on your success. You've had a hell of a good run on both sides of the border, and that's where I want to start, the border. When you know you want to be an actor, and you're from Canada, does that automatically mean I want to go to the States and make it big? Well, I didn't realize when I decided that I wanted to be an actor that that's what it meant. But mm. as you sort of got older and more aware of the world, you realized that we didn't actually produce much content here. Mm. And that if you wanted to play on the big field, it meant that you had to go down to the States to do that. And what did that entail? Well, you know, it was it was a uprooting, really. I had to rent the U-Haul and pack up my little apartment, and I moved down to Queens, New York, and had to get it. And it was hard and depressing, and took a long time to sort of get established there, and I missed home terribly. But it meant that I could have a career up here by having a career down there. So they want you here to have experience and uh, sort of a little bit of fame and a resume. And in order to get that, I felt I had to go down to the States and gather all of those things. And then I could come back up here and get roles like Sue Rodriguez. That sounds like a really typically Canadian thing, which is we don't really prize you until you've proven you can make it down there. Absolutely. Do you hate that? It's, it makes me crazy. Yeah. It makes me crazy. It yeah. makes me crazy that we don't have an industry here that really supports all the talent that we have. I mean, look at all the people that have moved down to Los Angeles. It's just we have drained our sort of cultural talent because they want to work, and the only mm. place they can is Los Angeles. Surely it's better here now, though, isn't it? I mean, it's better than th three and a half decades ago. It's a, yes, yeah. it's getting better. It's slowly but surely getting mm. better, despite, of course, efforts by sort of our regulators to mm. reduce Canadian content to the absolute bare minimums. But it is it is getting better, and people are working. And domestic production, oddly enough, is up this year. So, so can you have what would be considered a successful acting career only working in Canada? I think you can. I think you can look at somebody like Tatiana Maslany and say that she is going to have a very successful career. She will do American things as well, and I think everybody does. You end up supplementing with American things, but she has made an enormous name for herself, and rightly so, through Orphan Black, and it's a mm. Canadian co-pro. Right. How did you manage back and forth and back and forth? I mean, you did that for a long time, right? I did You're a lot of- You're still doing it, I guess. I did a lot of yeah. back and forth thing. Yeah. I did it in the day, of course, when they didn't have the computers at the uh, immigration. So mm. as an actor, going down to the United States was always very hard because they didn't want you in there. Mm. I didn't have any work papers. I was just sort of, so I would go back and forth across the border often. And if they would turn me down in one line, I would leave that line. I'd go into the bathroom. I'd change my clothes. I'd change my story. And I'd get into a different <laughs> line. And I'd, I'd make it through the border. So I always felt like Matahari, sort of, you know, sneaking through the border somewhere, praying that they didn't catch me. And well, you're an actor. I guess you could do that. I'm an actor. Change your story. Change exactly. your character. Why yeah, not? Exactly. You are, you, you, I mean, you live here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there enough work in Canada to kind of keep you here? There's, there's more work, yes. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can sort of make a living here. The, what I, what I found when I lived in the States was the longer I lived there, the more Canadian I became. I wanted, because as I saw what unfolded there, I yearned for what we had here. Where I feel most at home, where I feel my deepest connection to things is here, is 
up north is, you know, I belong in this country and I belong in this province. And so I really, I really felt when I was down there, I, I yearned to tell the stories that were our stories. I yearned to tell these stories of us. And so I felt like eventually I had to make a choice. I didn't want to always be flying off somewhere. I had children and mm. I wanted them to know this part of themselves. Apropos of that, do you know Eugene Levy? You must know uh, Eugene yes, Levy. I yes, do. I do, I do. Uh, I remember he once told me that that he liked working in Los Angeles because you got to do good parts in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and you make good money working in Los Angeles, but he would never in a million years think of raising his kids in Los Angeles, which is why he always stayed here. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We had a choice. We were actually living in San Francisco mm -hmm. um, for a time, which is, of course, a beautiful place to live. But I thought, if I'm going to raise the children and work, I don't want to do it. I had a choice. I could go to Los Angeles or I could decide that coming back to Canada was going to be okay and my mm. career in Canada was going to be enough. And that's the decision I made. So, Having, having said that, I, you know, Wendy, you haven't really had to slum it too much over the years. I mean, you're in some pretty boffo productions. I'm yes. thinking of 24 right now. I mean, you were yes, in 24. I was. I was. It was fantastic. Yep. <laughs> uh, where did they film that? Well, they filmed that in Los Angeles, they of, did, course, eh? of course, okay. but there was a big Canadian contingent in that show. Hmm. So it wasn't just Kiefer, but the producers and the creators were Canadian hmm. and they drew on the Canadian talent pool. So if you look at the cast list, you'll see lots of Canadians in that yeah, show. Yeah, which is why I kind of figured there's probably, I mean, some shooting that happens in Canada, maybe Vancouver or something, but no. I guess not. No, it was all Los Angeles. Very yeah. strange. Yeah. Can we see some of you in action here? I, sure. <laughs> well, don't be afraid. I'm not uh, getting anything too dramatic here. Uh, here's you, Wendy Cruz and Dr. Dana Kinney, Saving Hope. Roll tape, please. <sighs> Sweetheart. Oh. Are you okay? Define okay. You know, um... A wise woman once told me, if you run into a wall, kick it down. Did I say that? Yep. <laughs> and I've called on it on more than one occasion during treatment. Well, we're glad to have you back. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. I couldn't help but notice while that clip was on, you, you didn't really look at the monitor too much. D do you have a problem watching yourself on the screen? A problem watching myself on screen, Steve. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Do you? Yeah, it's I, hard. I kind of sense that, you know? Do you, I don't know. Do you find that when you, do you watch a lot of the shows back? I do never ever, watch the show. You never? I shouldn't admit that here, but the fact of the matter. He never watches I, the show. Because I, I have the same problem you do. Of course we do. Yeah. I think people can relate. If they think of themselves like watching a, a video of themselves or hearing their voice or something, how jarring it is and off-putting I, I but here's the difference once we've done this I've done it and I know what it's gonna look like when it's on the air but you don't because they're gonna shoot it from five different angles and someone's gonna edit it and someone's gonna add music to it and blah 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 mm -hmm. so aren't you mm -hmm. like you are a little curious to see what they're gonna do with your performance I'm only a little curious just a <laughs> tiny bit but I will tell you what I found out was that what I remember about the shooting of a scene is always much better than what I see. So I would prefer to keep that memory intact. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Be so. Because your memory of it is probably going to be better than how the director interprets it? Well, it will just be different. Different. It will be different, and I like mm -hmm. what I, and not to say that they don't do a wonderful job putting that mm -hmm. together and everything, but I do find it difficult, and I'm, you, I have that endless critical voice inside, and I, what were you thinking? That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe that. So. It was very funny. Because uh, <laughs> I, I watched you out of the corner of my eye, and I thought, she's not looking at the monitor. I wonder, I wonder what's going on there. Mm. When did you know, how old were you? When did you know you wanted to be an actor? I was, it was before I was five. I'd been with my mother at a United Church potluck dinner, and all the women were in the kitchen, and the little basement with the little stage was empty, and I went in and... This is where, Winnipeg? No, this was in uh, Oakville. Oakville, okay. In Oakville. And I uh, got up on that stage and remember looking around and thinking, oh, what a nice view from here. And I don't know, it was just came into my head like a bolt of lightning that this would be a great thing to do, to be a performer. So I, who knows where it came from? And my parents were obviously mystified that I would think this, but they were, have always been enormously supportive. So. Now, of course, they call it show business. And I wonder whether the, I mean, how brutal is the business part of trying to find your artistic soul? 
The business is very hard, mm -hmm. and a lot of people can't do the business. And why we have, of course, people who, starving artists, you know, the business part is hard. I have a lovely manager, Perry Zimmel, who has guided me through this whole thing, and he takes care of the business. Gotcha. And I get to then the go artist. on set and be the artist. That's nice. You graduated from Queen's University, mm -hmm. where you're getting an honorary doctorate. Isn't that cool? I am. When's that happening? That's happening in June. I'm only a little bit nervous because, of course, of the speech. You have to give a speech. I have to give a speech, and that has is giving me a little anxiety, <laughs> but we won't think about that right now. Do you know what you're going to say? I mean, you have to impart wisdom to several hundred aspiring uh, graduates. Exactly. Yeah. My children said to me, just don't tell them what to do. Did you, you played a lot of great roles over the years, have you ever got to know some of the people that you actually played? Um, yes, I, I, I've, I've gotten to know Louise Arbour slightly, hmm. which was this is remarkable. Supreme and Court judge. Supreme Court judge, um, chief prosecutor for the criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Ru Rwanda. Uh, tremendously smart woman. I didn't get to know her until after I played the part, unfortunately, because if I had, I always, I always apologize. Louise, I'm so sorry. I would have done it differently had I known you. Um, so that's a, a uh, Lorraine Evanshin. I certainly got to know before I actually did the Terry Evanshin story, which mm. was great. I love playing real people for whatever reason. That to me, there it, it's like this treasure chest of all the things as an actor that you look for, the minutia, the detail of somebody's life mm. are all the windows into their psyche. And with a real person, it's endless. They mm. do have everything right there. So I love that process of getting into somebody's life, into their soul. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess. Sue Rodriguez, the deepest, most meaningful part for you? Absolutely. Yes. Sue Rodriguez changed really my whole relationship to my work. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that I had ever found that sort of depth and connection with somebody. And I was so moved by that experience. So of course, you know, the other day, the first ALS patient Given permission, given by, the permission by the courts yeah. for physician-assisted suicide, and it made me weep for mm. Sue, mm. for how important that was, because I really think she started the conversation nationally on physician-assisted mm -hmm. suicide. So to be able to see this come to fruition feels so rewarding, and to think that I hope that she knows somewhere that she's there and she knows what has happened and how she began that. One person you played, whom I do know, because mm -hmm. she's in the political world, mm. in Jack Layton's biopic, Anne McGrath. Anne McGrath. Yeah. Um, are you interested in politics yourself? I'm certainly interested in politics. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly interested in, uh, in the change that we can bring about. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that fascinates me. I had the great good fortune uh, to get involved with ACTRA, our actors' union. Mm -hmm. And at the time, our executive director was Brian Topp was, you know, uh, chief of staff for Rachel Notley now, very political. And he really infused us all with this political intelligence and a real sort of um, ability to understand how to frame a problem, how to lobby a government, how to get change done. And he really piqued my interest. Well, I think he did. You tell me. I think you had a, a deeper connection with him because he, re, he of course, ran against Tom Mulcair for the NDP leadership, mm -hmm. and I think you hosted a fundraiser for him in your home. I certainly did. I hosted his first fundraiser in my home, and that was thrilling. Did he ever um, suggest to you, you know, Wendy, with your profile and your interest and your passion, you'd make a hell of a good candidate somewhere? I can't say that that's not something that I think about, but for the time being, as an actress, and I'm still knock on wood, getting some parts, so I will keep, that's my passion. That really is my passion. But who knows, there's lots of chapters in one's life. You never say never, do you? You never say never. Okay. Uh, Oscars, this year. Yeah. I want to ask you about the, uh, I mean, obviously it got a ton of attention that it might not otherwise have had because there were no people of color who were nominated in any of the major acting prizes. And I, is that the case in Canada as well? No. We I'm, don't have that problem in Canada. I'm happy to say we do not. Are we as good as we should be? No. Do we have that exact problem? No, we have a lot of diversity. I think on our screens, I think we really um, push to make sure that 
We're, we are inclusive. I think that, especially through the union, we're really focused on diversity as our strength. And I do think, if you look at the CSA awards, we do have diversity in our, as much as we should, no, but we do have some. Hmm. We're constantly hearing that this is the golden age of television. And if you look at mm -hmm. all of the different series, you know, HBO, Showtime, all the Canadian shows that are on as well, would you say that, that roles are available to you that are equally as good as ever? As a woman. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. It's difficult. It, it, roles are really still written for men. If you look at movies, there are a lot of men in movies, old men, young men. There's just men in movies. They're written from male perspectives, often. Mm -hmm. Still the writer's room, often all men. Directors, all men. Producers, still men. So I think we're, we're inching that needle along, but I think we have a long way to go in making sure that we have women in front of behind the cameras and women of not just women 20 to 33. But as you age in Hollywood, it gets more and more difficult to actually be seen um, in any way in film. And uh, I know that um, there was a little skit that was done recently, Amy Schumer. I think we just happened to have, have something a standing uh -huh. by. Excellent. Children, here we go. Inside Amy Schumer. Roll clip, please. In every actress's life, the media decides when you finally reach the point where you're not believably anymore. I mean, how do you know? Who tells you? Uh, well, nobody, uh, nobody really overtly tells you, but there right. are signs. You like, you know yeah. how um, Sally Field was Tom Hanks's love interest in Punchline, and then like 20 minutes later, she was his mom in Forrest Gump. Or you might get offered a rom com with Jack Nicholson, where you're competing with another woman. Or I just had an audition for Mrs. Claus. You're kidding me. I read for that part. I, did. I read for that too. You did? Yes. <laughs> hey, who got that? J Lo. <gasps> oh, she'll be good. She's gonna be really good. Okay, that's really funny. But there's the word that we couldn't say there's before, the word which we they beeped say in that production exactly, too. but yeah. that's that's the reality of the business. So, so you know, it's it's really difficult to uh, to sort of keep roles, to keep finding great roles. And I know often my lovely manager goes out there and says to people, just change the name, just make it a woman. Hmm. I know that that's what happened on Saving Hope. It was a part that was a man's part. Originally. But yeah, originally it was written just for a man. It. Change it, make it a woman. And so that's what they did. Having said that, the best Canadian movie of the past year, I'm mm -hmm. going to say, is mm -hmm. Room. Is Room. You were in it. Mm -hmm. The lead is a woman who won an Academy Award. So, I mean, lightning strikes, right? It happens. There are certainly yeah. great movies with mm -hmm. women as the leading roles. Certainly there are. There just aren't enough. What should we do about that? We just have to make sure that women are behind the camera, that we have women as directors and women as writers. And so everybody has to, as Trudeau did with his cabinet, made it 50% women. Why? Because it was 2015. And why? Because it's 2016 now. So that's what we need to do. We gotcha. Just make it equal. Gotcha. We got a couple minutes left here. Can I, I, I normally never ask people about their personal lives on this program, but you've been mm -hmm. kind of open and upfront about mm -hmm. the fact that you've had a significant change in your life mm -hmm. in the last few years. You have come out, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that has made it more, even more difficult, let's say even more difficult for you to get the kind of roles that you want. Well, I think because I passed that line that Amy Schumer and Tina Fey and were, were speaking, because I passed that line. I think you have, but you haven't I mean, actually. I walked I don't, over that line, I and so I don't think it matters as much anymore because I'm not sort of maybe being seen for those kinds of roles where it would really be significant. But I don't think it's made any difference. I don't feel like it has. As a matter of fact, I'm getting great roles. So I'm... You know, I don't think it has in any way maybe changed the picture for me hmm. right now. <laughs> okay, Wendy, one last question then. Sure. What's up for you next? Um, what's up next? Uh, we start the, another season of Saving Hope. Mm -hmm. I have a new series that premieres, premiered this week. It's called Slasher, is yeah, the name Slasher. of the series. So this was the best character I've had in a long time. My friend Erin Martin wrote the script for this, and she's the grandmother in it. But I get to put a whole new slant on Granny. So that's been very interesting. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you what a thrill it has been to have you here. Oh. Because uh, I've wanted to meet you for so long and never have, my fellow Hamiltonian. Yes. And it, it, you've been an absolute delight. Oh, so Steve, thank you so much for making you. time for us. It's oh. just been great. I've loved being here. Thank you so much.
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.